of all of us here live on the floor. Yeah. Please welcome Shane Olson and Matt Thorup to the main stage, ladies and gentlemen. How's it going, everyone? <laughs> I mean, I, I guess, right? <laughs> um, so let, let me introduce us, I guess. Um, so I'm Matt Thorup. Some of you might know me as the Red Beard from online. I don't, I don't know why. Uh, or, yeah. um, or from my work as Nicolas Cage's stunt double in Face Off. Uh, there's like three people that got the joke out there, and I'm their friend. And, uh, so we are from um, Avalanche and Disney Interactive. This is the very talented and beautiful Shane Olson. Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> so we are two character artists over at Disney Interactive, and we are, we are on the team that we sculpt and handle the characters on to make these beautiful characters for um, Disney Infinity. And so today what we're going to go over is kind of is our design process of, of what goes into making the Disney Infinity characters. You know, our collaboration efforts with the uh, concept artists, our collaboration efforts with, with Disney and Lucas and, and some of the external studios that we, that we work with. And, you know, the struggles that we go with, that, that happen and, and some of the, the happy mistakes that happen as well. So what I was going to do, I guess, um, a little bit about me and my background is I come from a graphic design background. How I got into the industry actually was I wanted to be, I was, I was an artist. I was a 2D artist uh, and I figured like, you know, I didn't tell anyone I was an artist. I was, because that was, you don't tell anyone you're an artist. That was embarrassing, you know? You kind of hide it from people. <laughs> um, and I, but I didn't know what I wanted to do. And then one day I watched The Incredibles and I was like, what is this? This is mind blowing. And I figure like, this is what I want to do. But like, nobody was teaching it anywhere. So I figure like, oh, I'll do, I'll be a graphic designer. And so I'm like, because that's, I guess, that's what you do. So I became this, I self-taught myself graphic design and, and was, got a job as a graphic designer making logos, you know, for a, for a nickel an hour. For, did that for a few years, got kind of good at it. And then um, saw this school that taught this new program called ZBrush. And... I was like, oh, whoa, whoa, wait, wait a second. What happened to the squares? What happened to the, what happened to the, like all the little squares that you just kind of move around one point at a time? And they're like, no, this is, this is cool. Just do this. And so I went to the school and, and, you know, after lo and behold, like many, a uh, few years later, I, I got an opportunity to work at Avalanche working on this new game called Disney Infinity with these ex in incredibly talented sculptors, um, such as Shane and, and this, these group of um, six sculptors. And they, they taught me a lot and, and luckily uh, allowed me to join their team after they beat me with sticks. Um, <laughs> so lo and behold, I, I'm now part of their team. And so this is, this is let, me, let me talk to you about some of the stuff that I've done with them. Some of the stuff that you've seen is, are some of the characters I've made are up here. Um, here are the couple of characters for 3.0 that I've, I've made. This is actually a team effort that, that Han Solo is not, is not mine. I, I can't claim credit for him. I, I mainly sculpted his face and a little bit of, on his pose, but really it was a joint effort. I think every single one of us on the team sculpted Han Solo, so I, I wanted to show him and because he was a collaborative effort. Um, Kanan was, was really fun because we had the whole concept team come together. And then Chewie, was, he was a whole a lot of fun. And he's another story, but I, I don't want to talk about these guys today. I just wanted to show them real quick. Um, oh, boy. Don't do that. Um, anyways, I wanted to talk about two characters specifically for 3.0. Um, and these... 
these are the two characters, is the first one I want to talk about was Korra. Korra was really fun because when first, when first asked to design Korra, first off, like, you're asked to design a, a character based on Olivia Wilde, you don't say no. Um, it, and this is no offense to my expecting wife, who, <laughs> who Olivia Wilde doesn't hold a candle to. Um, it, it, was just, it was just like, this is going to be great. And, but the, the turnaround on this character was super tight. I had, you know, I think it was six days. And we were designing not only her, but we were designing Sam at the same time. And um, another extremely talented sculptor on our team, Brad Bolander, was doing him. And these characters needed to not only like be finished, but they needed to look and feel like they existed and were designed together basically by the same person. And so we worked hand in hand on these characters, bouncing ideas off each other. Um, and so we, all that, and all that I had was this initial sketch from our lead concept character artist, um, John Diesta, was this. And we had this idea of like who Cora was. She, was. she was created from a digital environment, and she was very angular. She's, you know, she's really a princess. She was a princess character, so she was very elegant. Uh, and she had these very elegant, but she was also very active. And we wanted to, to have these, these ideas as shape language um, ideas to her. So, you know, and this is to, to get the idea of like this was her final, her final pass. And to know that like this needs to be done in one of the quickest turnarounds that I think that we've ever had for one of our characters. And so I'm like, okay, do you want to do it? I'm like, yeah, sure, why not? <laughs> um, I guess you don't say no. And so. We're going into that character, and so this is my first pass on, her, on this character, just to get prepared, I guess, uh, <laughs> was this. And I, did, and I did this character in black and white with no color, um, was this. And this doesn't happen where out of the gate, first pass, she looks pretty good um, with... You know, in, in the, from the art director, he's like, whoa, this is, this is really hitting all the spots. You know, everything's really angular. She's, you know, we're, we're losing those soft, those soft shapes that normally our princesses have in the game. She's a lot more angular. Um, she's not perfect, of course, but we're hitting, we're hitting the big, broad shapes right away. And, you know, Brad and I, we're working really, you know, pretty closely to, like, we want to hit these layers. Um, together, and then we also wanted to have some kind of refined under detail, which we've never really had before in any of our characters. We've really tried to hit this. We've tried to be true to these very um, vinyl style of characters, but we wanted to try something with um, some underlay detail. So we did this fun technique using uh, the UV master, and, and I wanted to show this technique. And, um, here real quick, if you guys don't mind. So, and, and I'll just, let's append a new tool here. So basically the idea is we, we made a plane, or I made a plane. Um, oh, let's make that 3D. And so after I made a plane, I just, I just hit project. And this automatically separates things into polygroups. So you have your top plane your, and your bottom plane, and then it surrounds it with um, a thickness. And it's all separated into polygroups. And so basically, we have this is which all it is. And so I, I would crease that. And I'm just, I'm doing this for the sake of speedness here. Um, creasing these polygroups. Subdivide this thing up um, a few times. And you know, so then I could have like some form to this. 
like let's have some some interesting form there. And feel free to be rowdy. If you guys have <laughs> questions, raise your hands or just yell. I mean, Louie's dying to ask questions. Or, I mean, he, he gets antsy when he's not talking, so. <laughs> Sitting over here like a caged animal. Yeah. A caged beast. Uh, um, yeah. Feel free to misbehave. <laughs> yes, feel free to misbehave. So, so I'd have the form. I'd first get the form, make sure. Then, then I have my polygroups already set, run up to this UV master here, work on clone. And it's, it's pretty simple right now. I can just hit polygons, hit unwrap, do a quick you know, flatten just to make sure that everything's there. Unflatten, copy my UVs, go back to this dealy here, paste my UVs, and now when I go into my surface, just hit noise, and I can load my alpha and for this case, I, you know, I just created a simple circle alpha. Um, turn off the noise scale, and I'm just using my, making sure to turn off 3D and just using noise. And you can start to see it. Um, And basically, I just made this, and, we, and me and Brad shared this. We kind of compared, like, how, and we actually played off of, like, how deep do we need to go for it not only to, like, not be too busy in the character, but also to show up once it's mass produced, because it was this fine line of, like, and that's going to draw way too much attention, but also it's all not going to show up once it's finally, you know, that size. Um, so we had to play around quite a bit. We actually did a lot of prototyping. Um, and once we were happy with that, you know, we had to play around with some ideas. And, and we were, were only worrying about one side, so it didn't matter that the seams were not lining up, so we didn't have to like, bring it into another program, line up the seams and things like that. We just worried about the exterior side. So like, for example, you can see on this, like, I, we had that rough idea, I don't know if you can see it up there, um, of like the initial pass of like what it would look like. But that's, this was obviously not deep enough. Um, but then we jumped into like starting to add color to start bringing some more of herself out. And she started to become like this. And so now in this phase, because it's such a quick turnaround and I'm like, Oh yeah, and by the way, during this process of this quick turnaround, I'm leaving on vacation. And the whole team is also on vacation. So we had one of our partner companies, Ninja Theory. We have um, a great team over there, and we sent it over to this modeler, Gene. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to kill her last name. It's Hing Hu. And she's going to hate me for that. Um, <laughs> but she actually did the first pass on the pose. And this is our first pass in the pose here. So this is our first pass in the pose. And it's nearly perfect. It's great. Like, she killed it. She did such a good job. Like, everything's really dynamic. And it's not a straight arm. She's got these great kinks in it. Um, there's, there's some, there's a little bit of um, balance issues that that I corrected from it, but it's, it, it was really, really strong. Um, there was just little, little things I corrected, just like head size manufacturing issues, but she, she did a really good job. So this is what we ended up with, but it was, you know, it, it's, it's sometimes kind of hard to like let go of your character, you know, um, especially when you work by yourself a lot, but it's, you see a lot of benefits, and, and uh, you can really see some great things that like other people can bring to the table um, 
when you're working in, in you know, a collaborative system like this. So I, I just wanted to bring one side of like the tale of what happens when a character basically goes right from the get-go. Now this doesn't happen all the time, but it does happen. Um, Shane's seen it. Um, rarely. Rarely. But it, and this is like an anomaly. Um, I'm going to tell another story <laughs> of a character that doesn't go so great. Um, and, that's, it's, and that's okay. And I, and I want to make sure that everyone understands that, that. I think this is what people expect, is that this is what happens all the time. This is what happens 1% of the time. Most of the time, this doesn't happen. Um, but this is probably the expectation, and this may be even the expectation from a lot of art directors, but it's not what happens. <laughs> um, so I'm going to tell a very different tale on my, our other character. So the other character that I want to talk about is this guy. And this is a guy that I, I requested to work on. He was... So when we started um, Disney Infinity 3.0, we have, you know, your wish list of, like, who, could, who do you want to work on? And he was probably um, my number one or number two, and I think my number one was Chewie, and my number two was, was Darth Maul, and, and because mainly I thought he would be really hard, and he was. Um, and this is the final, this is our final Darth Maul. And he was, he was probably one of the hardest characters I've ever worked on. Um, he was really, really challenging. And mainly because with, with what we wanted to do with Star Wars, we had some limitations, um, which isn't a bad thing. Like, limitations are, are really nice, but it... We, it's, it's good to, to have those limitations to bring you in, but with, with Darth Maul, we kind of wanted to push our envelope to see how far we could stylize one of our characters because in our, the, the whole the philosophy behind our Disney Infinity characters um, mainly is you want, we want to stylize them to a degree that they're definitely stylized, but you instantly recognize who that character is. They instantly feel like the character. Notice that I'm not saying they look like the character, but they feel like that character inside and out. And that's what we want. So, um, but we really, really wanted to push Darth Maul. And so we had some really, really interesting concepts. So this is one of the first initial concepts that we are that was being pushed really hard, which is awesome. Like, this is so cool. Um, this is one of the early concepts by John Diesta, and it's really, really cool. But the, the thing that was missing from it is it just doesn't feel like Darth Maul when you see Darth Maul. He's not this big, broody guy. He's not someone that's going to go, like, punch through a door and, you know, have everything explode. He's, he's a lot more ninja-like and... And, it, and though it was cool, it was just not hitting that mark. And so we went down some different paths. And um, our, one of our other incredibly talented uh, concept artists, um, Jason Kim, started coming up with an idea that looked like this, which, which was really cool. You know, he's, he's one of our more ominous villains, so we wanted to have a lot more sharp angles to him. A, lot of, a little bit more darker presence. And so we started going down this path. And so we started playing around with that direction. And so as I started developing that idea in concept, um, things started to, to, to go wrong because Disney Infinity, uh, the, one, of the, the can, one of the limitations that we deal with is that we have... Now, Shane, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but we have probably over 100 characters in our game, right? Close to 100? Yeah, I lost count. Yeah, we lost <laughs> count. And we, we, because we have so many unique characters, we have to confine to certain rigs, um, which, again, is, is okay to have limitations to this. Um, so we have to find some, somewhere where this guy fits in to one of these things. 
So as I'm developing this concept, though this concept is killer, we're trying to fit this concept into one of our rig boxes. Um, and it's, it's not really working out, and we can, kinda, we can instantly tell that it's not working out. He's, he's a little too small, he's a little too nerdy, he doesn't feel dark, he doesn't really feel menacing, so we're going to bump him up a little bit. And I start pushing around some shapes, but now he's, he's feeling almost too evil, a little bit too evil even for a kid's game, especially like in the eyes, um, you know, a little bit too sinister. And he's kind of even feeling like a football player, which, which is, again, just not what we wanted. And so we start revisiting some things and, and some ideas. Let's see where we get, we get going on this. And there's another concept that John Diesta comes up with that, that starts lengthening him because... We're just starting to, we just start pushing them around. And so we just come up with this idea. And so I start sketching around some ideas myself because why not? Um, and I sketch out something like this that pushes them a little bit more towards what the actor looks like. And just, you know, to push my own two cents in. Um, and at the same time, we start working with, I mean, this whole time during this process, we're working with. A, an, incredibly, an incredibly talented um, traditional sculptor by the name of Darren Marshall, who actually was, worked on the concept art for uh, the Clone Wars. He worked on the traditional sculpts for the Clone Wars. And we thought, you know, who better to take, you know, who better to take advice from than someone that's worked on the Star Wars franchise themselves. So I'll show this image. And so he started coming up with some ideas which really, you know, had some good ideas for the body to help us find uh, a, b a balance between what would work for the, the better proportions to, to make him look bigger without making him look bulky and better proportions for the head. And so we, we really riffed off each other. Me and him actually, you know, sent versions back and forth until we got to... to this, which actually started to feel a lot more like Darth Maul. You know, and then this whole time we're, we're still trying to, to battle it out in our brains of like, so what does Darth Maul actually wear? Because <laughs> he has like 17 different layers. <laughs> If you watch the films, and we would stop, we'd watch and pause and like, okay, what does he actually wear? Um, and so once we were actually satisfied with, with this general idea of, you know, what he was looking for, we're like, okay, so we're 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 pretty happy with his T pose. Now we're going to push it into his his pose. And. Our first idea is, is we just want to get something in, just something pushed in there. We don't want any really idea of like a form. Like we just want to get something in there to kind of to feel things out. It's going to be sloppy. It's going to be ugly. We just want the overall gesture, and that's what the, that's what we have. You know, just a quick, simple push of like, okay, will this will the overall balance work? Will the overall look work? Is it going to you know? Are things, you know, pushed too far, and that's that's all we want. So once we have it there, we start refining things. And so we start playing around with things and, and then different different obstacles start start presenting them, themselves of like Okay, are these twirly bits, are they going to be thick enough to hold up? So we start doing test prints. And so we, we work, we do all of our prototyping in-house. We have an Envision Tech printer, and we set up all of our prints ourselves. 
We handle all the prints ourselves. We clean up their prints ourselves. We get print resin in our eyes ourselves. Um, <laughs> it burns, if you're wondering. Um, we do it all, and it's quite fun and painful. But so we learn very quickly, like, what's going to be too thin? But we also, you know, we find, we find what some, some solutions. So things start to feel like really blocky, and we try to find solutions to these. And, and that's something that we wanted to find. You know, we didn't want it just to feel like a block like these things. So we try to find different solutions of like, OK, we want it to, to flow a little bit better. And I don't know if that comes across here, but anyways, we'll, we'll get to that. <laughs> but um, apparently what the art director felt like wasn't enough here was going to be we needed more twirly bits. <laughs> uh, <laughs> official to make word. The official word was twirly bits. So we added like 17 more twirly bits to give him more life. And we studied so much on the twirly bits. I can't emphasize enough. And then so we are down the line on this. And the back and forth on Lucas, and they love this. They're, they're really happy about where it is. And um, it's, it's, we're probably a couple days out from sending it to manufacturing. We've gone through multiple levels of like working with Lucas on like getting approvals through this. And we're about to send it off to the factory and, and our art director, our main art director, Jeff Bunker, comes in and, and he looks at it and he says, oh, that's great. Uh, is that going to fit in the box? Because it's, <laughs> it's got to fit in the box. And I, uh, I look down at it, because he's the only <laughs> character that has two lightsabers coming out of it. And I'm like, uh, <laughs> nope, <laughs> yep, nope, yep. And this is like, I'm like freaking out, because we were so concerned about getting this pose to feel like Darth Maul, like he's going to, you know, he's going to kick some Jedi butt. And that, like, I don't even know what happened, because normally we, we stress that. Right. We have, we have a box that we bring in. We, we have a box, yeah. like a digital box. You know, we took three weeks to sculpt this box. Um, speaking, of bo speaking of boxes, guys, <laughs> a, speaking of boxes, there's a question here on the Twitter feed. Oh, yeah. Do you guys use image planes for reference? From Fernando Di, I'm going we, to butcher this. Fernando Di Pivone at Maria. You want me to take this one? Yeah, go for it. So we actually use um, Spotlight. I learned this from the one and only Joseph Drust. And uh, what I'll do is um, I'll take all the background coloring and I'll turn it to black. And then I'll take the image itself and I'll pop it up just so it's not black, any, any of the darkest areas. And then if you load it into Spotlight, you can hover it instead of using the image planes. Because when you're using image planes and you're in there sculpting, it whips them all around and you have a hard time seeing it. But if it's spotlight, you can hover it and, and just park it right there. And uh, when, when I go up there, I'll show you, there's a little spot where you have to turn off projection so the brushes will work when you have that going. But that's, that's how we use our references. Yeah. That work? <laughs> yes. All right. Yeah, and so we have this box. Anyways, um, and so, like, we're kind of freaking out because this is a dramatic pose, and he holds it in a very, like, dramatic way. And now I'm like, oh, man, I wanted this character, and now we're, this is, yeah. <laughs> Anyways, so Jeff leaves, and I'm like, I've got this idea. So I turn off everything but the lightsaber, bring in the box, and I pose it, just the lightsaber in just the right way that only like only the lightsaber can fit basically like from if the box is here it only fits like from tip to tip there's no other way this lightsaber can fit in this box 
is from tip to tip. Like if it tilts any other way, it's not going to fit inside this pose. And I repose just the arm to make it fit just like that. And then kind of and fix and just repose the arm. And he comes back in like 20 minutes later and he's like, does he fit in the box? <laughs> and I'm like, yes, yes, Jeff. <laughs> It fits in the box now. <laughs> and so then they threw confetti in the air, and everyone was happy again. And the Ewok celebrated. And he said, OK, you don't, you don't have to clean out your desk this week. <laughs> Next week, though. <laughs> um, so yeah, but I mean, it's, it's kind of like a, it's, it's interesting because like, I still feel like a really young dude. Like, I, I grew up watching this stuff. Um, you know, I'm sitting right here, right? Yeah, I mean, this guy's like <laughs> Ancient. 76 and, and <laughs> kind of dying next to me. And, uh, and like, to think, like, I, I had, you know, I had never dreamed that I would be a part of making any of this. And it's to be to think that I was any, in any part related to making anything related to Star Wars, anything to related to Disney, it's just mind-boggling. Mind and it's, it's really like a humbling experience to be here to like talking about making this is like my heart's crying inside right now. <laughs> um, so, I mean, this is just, anyways. That's, so thanks for coming out. That's, this is my spiel of... Matt Thorup, everybody. Yeah. That's Matt Thorup, ladies and gentlemen. Matt Thorup. Keep it going, keep it going. <laughs> All right, what, do, what are we looking for on, on, or looking at on time? Say again. Give me one second. All right. How's it going, everybody? Yeah, I'm Shane Olson, Olson and uh, I work with this guy uh, at Avalanche, Disney Interactive. And uh, I've been at Avalanche for next October, it'll be 10 years. Um, yeah, I'm an old guy. <laughs> and uh, before that, I worked at like six, six different studios. We're from uh, Utah, that's where Avalanche is. Um, Avalanche existed and then Disney came in and bought them. Uh, they made this game called Attack and the Power of Juju caught, caught their attention. They're like, that studio's got something going on. So uh, they made the purchase, and I came on right after Disney bought them. Um, I've been doing games for, gosh, like 15 years, 1998, something like that. So when he say that, says The Incredibles is what inspired him. If you guys remember Wally B, the, fr the first Pixar short, that's what inspired me. I'm like, I'm going to do that. You know, it's like the first thing ever. So, yeah, I'm feeling really old. Thanks. <laughs> okay, let me, uh, I'm just going to load up my interface really fast, and then I'm going to show you some stuff I've done. Uh, you guys watched the Sculpt Off yesterday? Anybody? Yeah? That was a lot of fun. <laughs> the most stressful three hours of my life, but it was great. <laughs> Let's see. Uh, no, no, no. Okay. We all make our custom user interfaces. And because, uh, you know, I, I do have to say, if ZBrush didn't exist, this would be a huge, huge pain in our rears. I don't think we could do this without ZBrush. So uh, this, this has been amazing. And I love how, how um, customizable the inter user interface is. Um, and we do things differently. We each have tutorials and stuff on, up, up on Gumroad and stuff, and uh, you'll see that we do things a lot differently f from each other. Um, and that's, it, that's really nice with ZBrush because it allows you to do, do it your own way. So let's see. Just I'm open this. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so here, here are some of the, the characters I've done. Uh, let's see. Like Olaf and Ahsoka, yeah, she's in the starter pack with Anakin. Small image. Anakin was kind of like Darth Maul in a way that <laughs> <laughs> he didn't come together right away. 
uh, it was really, really hard getting a likeness for the actor um, and this, this pose. And he also has all these, uh, what is it, twisty bits? <laughs> right? Twirly bits. Twirly bits, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, and Joy from Inside Out. And Venom, Tinkerbell, Syndrome. I love Syndrome. That's another thing we have to think about is uh, we have this, this little weight that we got from the factories. We have to test the points to make sure they're not too pointy. Some little three-year-old's going to poke their eye out. So like, we had to uh, polish down the points on Syndrome's hair. They were, they were too pointy. No, Spider-Man. We and it, it takes a small army to put these together. Um, we we sculpt them, but we there's a lot of people that come in and help us with the renders and help us with the animation and the audio, and it, it takes a ton of people to make our stuff look good. So thank you everybody at Avalanche and the outside companies. Um, this is uh, Randall. This is one of the characters that was like Cora for me. He came together like in a day, and. Uh, because he's really simple. Gibbs, Mickey, everyone knows that guy, right? Lightning McQueen, and Loki. All these guys. Barbosa was awesome. He came together pretty fun, too. Tracks, okay. But I wanted to show you guys. Uh, I did, uh, when, he, when he asked to do Darth Maul, my favorite character from Star Wars, well, one of them, is uh, Boba Fett. And I'm a huge Boba Fett fan. And uh, he was also a really big challenge because I'm not a hard surface sculpting guy. So um, I wanted the challenge, and so I requested to, to do that one. And uh, here is the concept and the, the final image of him. Um, and you'll see a bunch of the drawings from the concept department. Uh, yeah, they're, they're, we have some of the best artists in the country working at Avalanche. We're so, <laughs> so lucky to have these guys working with us. Um, so, and you'll notice um, we don't usually get turns. A lot of people ask, you know, do you get your, you ask your concept artists for turns so you can see them from the side and from the front. And I don't know about you, Matt, but yeah. I prefer not to have turns. I prefer to have the three-quarter because the three-quarter is really selling that figure. And uh, you, know, you can see the essence of Boba Fett in this pose. And they kind of just become stiff and lifeless. And it also forces the concept artist to dig back into their brain and see what they were thinking and dissect it themselves. And they're usually not 3D guys. Um, and so it's, it's kind of difficult for them to dig back into their brain and pull that stuff out. I would rather try and uh, do it myself and then ask them, is, is this kind of what you were thinking? It's uh, really nice to go back and forth with our concept artists and our directors and uh, even the other character people, bring them in to say, you know, what, is this working? What do you think about this? And, uh, and as far as the styling goes, uh, you know, Boba Fett's a complex character. He has a lot going on. So how do you simplify a character that's that involved? And so we also get together and talk about, you know, what, what can we, we omit? What are the most important things that Boba Fett has that he needs to have? Like his, his little rockets and spikes and, you know, shooters on his arms and the backpack and all that kind of stuff. And... Uh, so we, we come to the conclusion of you know, where we should go with that. And we also, um, and there's, there's color in mind too. So, um, and you'll notice these poses over here. What we do uh, with these is I will build a T pose of him first, like this. And you'll, you'll notice the backpack's all horrible. <laughs> And uh, just the, some of the designs, like the, this little wrist thing is not, not working out. And we're missing some details. But we'll go to the low resolution version of this. And if I'm using Dynamesh and stuff like that, I will actually Z remesh it. And just to get a rudimentary low subdivision level for that piece. And then we will take the low resolution mesh, 
throw it over to our rigging department. They'll rig it up inside uh, Maya, and then we have this amazing concept artist, Jason Kim. He's really, really good at uh, posing characters. And so he will take the low resolution mesh and he will just go bonkers with trying all these different poses. And he'll get together with some of the other concept guys and come up with you know, what is a good Boba Fett pose, what says Boba Fett about this guy. And so we, uh, we go back and forth as an OBJ and when we also can send this to the to the, uh, the like LucasArts, for example. We'll send this over to LucasArts, and they will say that one. And they'll pick the pose, and um, then what we'll do is we'll bring it back, we'll refine it, and sometimes we don't have the character ready yet. You'll see back in the background right here, this is Nova. And so we, we because Nova is on the same rig that Boba Fett is, so we wanted to try some poses out really quick. And so, and he was already rigged, so we didn't have to wait and then, and then we came back and posed the real guy. And uh, how we work that out is, um, so I'll have the, uh, the T-Pose guy, and then we'll go to T-Pose Master to go to pose him. And there's a technique we use after you go down to the low resolution mesh. You can import an OBJ as, a, as another subtool. And so we will import the, the pose that was done in Maya as an OBJ as a template after you've gone down to the Tipos master. And so there's two subtools in there. And we'll use that because you can use the transparency stuff and, and match him. And you can also use our artistic tendencies to you know, get, him, get him looking as good as we can. And then before you go back up to the high resolution mesh with the, the Tipos master, you have to make sure you delete that second subdivision. And then, uh, then it'll go up just fine. So uh, that's, how we, that's how we get our poses. And uh, in the workshop tomorrow, I'm going to go over that in detail um, for those of you going to that. So um, let's see what else. And you'll notice, um, you'll notice he's beige. And, and this is, is kind of how you see him in the, in the film. And LucasArts came back and they said, we want to make him blue. We're like, you want to make him blue? What do you want? <laughs> And they're like, yep, the, the very, very first Kenner toy that was ever made of, of Boba Fett was blue. And th these are the, the colors that, that they had. And we ha I wish I could show you the reference, but it's like lock and key, you know? <laughs> they, they literally built this room and, uh, with, <laughs> with, with <laughs> the room. like the security. You can't take your cell phone in there. And yeah, it was, it was nuts. So uh, they, they keep their stuff under lock and key pretty hard. Um, anyway, uh, I, think, I think Sideshow made a new, a m more recent one, and he, he's also blue. So uh, this is the final version uh, after everything. I'm going to open this up in ZBrush so you can see. Let me start with a whole new thing here. Um, that's another thing really, really quick. It's, it's hard for me not to interject all these things that I do. But uh, I always start with a brand new... Uh, Z project when I when I start a new character, not wax sphere though, because then it cleans everything out. It cleans all the Z tools out of here, and then I can import uh, or I can load a tool into that scene. So, um, also usually uh, we'll start with now. Now that we're on to Infinity 3.0, we have a lot of characters, a backlog of characters, and we have the like the skinny bodies and the medium bodies, the males, the females, all that. And if, if we're starting a, a humanish character, um, sometimes we will bring in and we'll kit bash. So this is, this is a medium character here. And uh, this is actually from one of uh, Matt's sculpts. He did Falcon from Marvel. And this is where he started. And so with, with a character like Darth Maul or whoever fits on a medium, we'll start with a guy like this and uh, then we'll just start building parts onto him. So I will show you how we build parts onto him in a minute. Um, and so as far as our workflow goes, we will build the T-Pose first, um, like this, and we will push it as far as possible. Um, so this, this is 
this is after. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think I have a version of him bef before going to pose, but this is, um, we take him to T-pose as far as we possibly can, and we also have to keep manufacturing things in, in mind. So for his antenna on his helmet, you'll see how he had to set it right down on his helmet. We can't have it floating up above because it'll break off, and we have to thicken that thing up. And it's not really that thick in the films. And we have to thicken up all these different parts. And he has these braids that go around, you know, these Wookiee braids, I guess, that go around his shoulder. And they hang and they fly. And uh, we couldn't really have those hanging off, so we had to come up with a solution to wrap them around his shoulder. And uh, we also have to send all these decals to the factory. We have to make them up in um, Adobe Illustrator. We have this amazing concept guy. Uh, Ben Simonson, he does a fantastic job making all these decals, like Lightning McQueen, he just went nuts on him. <laughs> and uh, so anyway, we have to figure out, uh, an, we have to pay attention to the, all the undercuts and how, how it all assembles. And then when we get to this point and our art directors have cleared it, then we can take it into pose. And we'll pose it just like I explained before. And then, we will discover a lot of things in the pose, um, and a lot of things change. Let's see. So I'm actually showing you the reverse of it. So my T pose didn't look like this. So here's, here's the, uh, the final guy. And you'll notice this ruler in here. Um, ZBrush doesn't really have specific units, like, like Maya or anything like that. So we, we build. Well, I built this ruler at 140 millimeters, so when I use the 3D print exporter, I can set it to exactly 140 millimeters, and anything within that, that build volume will export at the right size. So that's, where, that's why that's in there. So I'll hide that. And uh, I always build everything. And here's, here's a version of the cape. Um, our art director, um, John Diessa wanted to see a, a different cape to see what it would look like coming off of the other side for better flow. So this, this was a, an idea that we had, but every picture that you see of Boba Fett, he's got his cape hanging off his left side. And so we couldn't hang it off the right side and have it blowing in the wind that way. Um, so we just went back and forth and we finally ended up with the one that we have now. So. Um, okay, I'm going to go back and I'm going to show you really quickly this guy. And I'm going to show you how we do some of the hard surface stuff, like, uh, like capes. It's not really hard surface, but uh, I guess a, a, a surface with a thickness. Um, I use this technique over and over and over again. You might have seen, if you, if you saw me in the sculpt off, I made a... I made these, these leaf arms, and this is the technique that I use to make those, those leaf arms. And what I do is I, is I take this uh, topology brush, and the, uh, the item that you're going to do this to can't have any subdivision levels. Find the button here. So what I'll usually do is I'll duplicate it, and then I will uh, get rid of the lower subdivision levels. So say I'm going to make a, like Boba Fett's wrist guard around, around here. And so what I'll do is I'll take this topology brush and I'll just draw some quick topology on there. I, I don't usually do symmetry. I'll build it first and then I'll mirror it over. And this is really, really nice because you can just, because I'm, I come from the Maya world, I, I'm, I'm still holding on to polygons for some reason. <laughs> so I, I kind of like this technique of, of just drawing polygons on the surface. And everybody asks us, how, how do you keep it so clean? And the answer is, touch it as little as possible. So meaning, when you're sculpting on it with uh, clay buildup, you're making lumps and bumps, and it's, it's getting nutty. So that's great for concepting and figuring it out. But once you get there, um, you, you can retop the surface and rebuild it and then subdivide it down. You'll see right here, I'll show you. Uh, and then it becomes clean. 
trying to remember the, the guy from e 3D, his name, Mike Palfovich. Am I destroying his name? Palfovich. I'm, I'm borrowing his, uh, his techniques here, so. Yeah, his, his hard surface video is great. So once I get something like this, you know, I can go all the way around the arm. I can do little bits and pieces. It doesn't matter. I did uh, Loki. I did his cape this way. Um, what I did with his cape really quick was I took a sphere, and he was already posed down in this hunch pose with his, with his cane, cane, scepter, whatever. <laughs> old, old Loki. Old man with his, Loki. <laughs> <laughs> old man Loki. So... Uh, he was already posed down there, and so what I did is I just seriously just took a glob of, of a big sphere, and I just posed it into the shape, and I'm only paying attention to the top surface of the sphere, and it's making the undulations of that cape, and I have this, uh, this cloth brush, and I, I made it the surface, and then I just drew over the top of it just like this. So when, once I get to this point, I turn the draw size down to, to one, because if the draw size is any thicker than that, it's going to actually make thickness when I tap on the surface like this. See how it has thickness? And if that's what you want, that's great. But usually in the game world, we make normal maps. And normal maps, when the envelope is outside of this arm and it's going to, it's going to ray trace back down to that arm and capture these elements, if if it's a 90 degree wall, it's not going to see it, and you're not going to have it in your, in your normal map. So uh, I use panel loops, so then I can control the bevel on the edges, and I'll show you how I do that. So undo that, and if you turn your draw size down to one, and then tap on the surface. So now it makes, you can kind of see it in there. I'm going to solo this. Then I'm going to hide it. Hand solo. <laughs> right. All right. It's peanut gallery. Come on. So what I want to do is I want to see other two separate poly groups. I want to get rid of the, the arms. There we go. Okay. So now I have my special menu, but I don't have a hotkey. Delete hidden. Um, and then I, so at this level, this is, this is the level I want right here. Because then I can go in here and I can just tweak, tweak all these little verts to make this really buttery smooth and flow the way I want it. And I can also pull it out away from the arm if I want to. And with the uh, panel loops, you can either uh, extrude it in inward or outward. So let's see, I'm just going to pull it out a little bit and extrude inward. We doing okay on time? Okay. <laughs> okay. So I, we always pay attention to flow and straights and curves like these arms. We always look for straights with curves in it. Anyway, um, so to make this thickness here, go to uh, edge loop and then panel loops. And what I'll do is I'll just turn this down to one because I only want one loop around the edge. I'll turn polish off to zero, turn bevel down to about 13 or so. And then this is the bevel profile. And by default, it's shaped like this. And this is the profile as if you are looking at something like this, and this is the profile, and this is the bevel. So then you're, you're turning it like this, and now you're looking at it. Does that make any sense? So I want it to bevel on, a, on, a, on an edge like this. So let's see. So I will take care of these dots. If you drag off the panel, it'll, it'll pop those points off. So now I have this, this bevel shape, and then I'll just try it. So it's too thin, and it's going out. So I can t change my elevation to minus 100. Um, I'm going to turn the bevel up a little bit and turn up the thickness. Try that. 
and you just go back and forth until it looks like what you want. Then, this is, this is the trick. Um, see how the, the ring is all one polygroup? Well, I want it to be polygroups on each side, so then I can crease it. So I have this, uh, let me see, I'll show you where it really is instead of going to my shortcuts so you'll know where it is. So if you go to polygroups, it's got all these menus open. Polygroups, da, 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 right there. Then it's uh, polygroup by normals. And then I beveled it too much, one second. So it, it looks at, it's trying to find 90s or very close to those edges because it's looking to group it by the direction of the normal. So if it's too close, it's going to group them together. And there's a little slider right here, this max min that you can adjust to, to fix it. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go back and make the bevel a little less. So really quick. Uh, no, no, no. Where is it? Oh, up here. Okay, turn this back down. Okay. Back to polygroups, and then group by normal. Okay, that's what you want. Then you'll see that I have every end is a different polygroup. And what I can do is I can go to, uh, back to geometry, go to crease. Where is it at? There it is. Okay, so uh, there's crease by polygroup right here, crease PG. And what I want to do is I want to turn this crease level to three. That means you'll subdivide it. It'll hold that crease for three subdivision levels, and then it'll let it go after four, five, and six, however high, high you go up, and that will create this nice beveled crease. So turn that to three, hit crease polygroup, and you'll see it'll indicate it by these little li lines right here. And then you can just uh, subdivide it down. Oh, come on. Did you guys watch that? Let me undo it. So subdivide, it's going to bevel right there. So, so now this edge isn't, it's not going to cut your eye. It's like a little. So then you can come in here and you can just, you know, smooth it out, and get it super clean. But that's, that's uh, how we do our really clean stuff. And you can see how it's kind of lumpy and bumpy in here. And how, how you even push it further is you want to go back down to the lower subdivision levels and uh, straighten that out with your move tool. Just get the nice flow going back in there, divide it back up. And that's, that's how I do all the capes and the wrist guards and pretty much everything. And so what, what happens when your art director comes and says, you know that cape, it's, I don't want to go in this way, I want to go in that way. Like, well, now what am I going to do? If I, if, I, if I start moving this, you know, it's going to look like crap even at the low subdivision levels, you know, because it has two sides to it. So how do you move something with two sides? Well, you don't. What you do is you, uh, you delete everything back down to a single polygon plane again. Then you make all your edits on that single polygon plane, and then you go through and you add the thickness right back in because it's so easy. So. Uh, that's, that's how I do it. That's how we do, I don't know if that's how you do your cloth, like all of Darth Maul's twirly bits. Um, you, you just do all these single pane panels, and, uh, and then you just add the thickness after you're happy with the placement. That way you're not getting lost in, you know, move the poly land. <laughs> so, um, I, think, uh, I think that's all I got. Did, uh, oh, no I don't. Hold on a second. Hold the phone. The Secrets of the Universe. Yes. I have a movie. There's a question coming in as well while right. you're loading. Oh boy. Richard Lighton says, Zebra Summit, could you use Z-Modeler to the same effect? Z-Modeler, do you want to take that one or do you want me to? Um, I, I found out that like Z-Modeler, I've, I've been using that for all of my accessories. Like, 
I've been, you know, bringing in simple instances and just building out little things really quickly and, and found great, you know, building that for simple geometry and then, you know, using Shane's techniques of deleting sides and then beveling that out or, or just using that and, and putting in um, little bevels or, or anything like that. So yeah, you could use Zmodeler very much with this, so yeah. Yeah, yeah. I'm still trying to get my head around the whole thing because it's so deep. And, uh, but it's, it's very, very nice that I don't have to leave ZBrush to use it. I can just, like, like those little pieces on, on Boba Fett's helmet, you know, I'll, I'll quickly make those. And uh, so like, also the, the part around his helmet that goes up, that goes down like that, I use the exact same technique that I just showed you guys, and I just draw that part on the helmet, extract it off, bevel it, and there you go. It's, it's really, it's, it's kind of cheaty. <laughs> So um, I was just going to show you this uh, Boba Fett reveal, reveal movie really, really quick. Uh, this is the, the reel they showed at E3 this year when they revealed Boba Fett. So I'll show you this, see if it opens. There's sound on this too. Do you guys have sound? Yay, Boba Fett. <laughs> awesome. Not bad for a Saturday yeah. afternoon. What's that? Not bad for a Saturday afternoon. <laughs> One more time. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Get some of the brown stuff flowing. You were going to say something, you had your finger Yeah, yeah, yeah. I had one more thing to, to interject right there. Uh, because, you know, we are making a game and not just toys. A lot of people had questions about, well, you know, where do your game characters come from? And you saw that, the, the T-pose that I had of Boba Fett there. Um, they come from the T-pose. So what we do is we take the, the T-pose and we, we re-top right on top of it. And what we do is we, we top different parts. So from the waist cut down, um, we will merge all those together and then we will retopologize right on top of that um, a game resolution mesh, or model, sorry. And then we will uh, transfer the maps from the high to the low. And then we will, and we have to build it for game deformation. So we have to be really aware of that. And that, that way the character in the game is as close to, if not exact, as the, the model, the toy that you play with. So it really becomes that character when you put it on the reader. So, yeah, any, any other questions? It's way in the back, hold on <laughs> one second. Sneak me in through here. You can stand if you like, sure. What are you drinking? We're drinking? some B-roll while we're going. Oh, it's got a monster. I thought it was a beer. <laughs> Um, is there any big difference between creasing by polygroups and, and setting the crease tolerance to an angle? Is, or would that, is there any reason? Um, yeah, so crease by angle, if you have all your angles set just right, it works great. But I like to have more control than that. So that's why I'll go through and, and set up my polygroups exactly how I want. Because, uh, when, when you're in there, uh, well, for, for example, Boba Fett's shoulder right there, you can see his shoulder plate. There's a crease right down the middle, and I will, I will polygroup that in two pieces, and it's not, it's not quite the angle that I need it, so I'd rather polygroup it together and do it that way. So um, I used to use crease by angle all the time, but until I discovered that trick. Cool, so, thank you. Yeah. There's more. I saw them on my way here, slithering my way to the front. Pretty cool shots of in-game. Look at that. <laughs> Go ahead here, sir. State your name for the record. Oh, hi. I'm Chris. This is Chris, everybody. Oh. <laughs> um, uh, what perspective are you working on in ZBrush in order to figure out uh, the collectible size and in-game? 
what standard perspective? <laughs> like what do you what do you like camera angle? Like what do you the, mean by the, perspective? The draw size, I guess, or the perspective? The, like the scale. Like the, I think he means a focal length. That's where you get focal. Focal length is what you're getting at. Inside a ZBrush, what do you get your focal length set at? Uh, default. Yeah, it's just the default, default, which is five one, zero yeah. fifty. Yeah. Quick. It's yeah, yeah. five zero, right? Yeah, From just defaults. Memory. Fifty. I mean, we've know, played around with like that, but but really because it's a you know it's manipulated compared to like what is actually in scene. Right. It we turn it on and off so much that it it, it and we really like we base so much more on printed prototypes than. Then act, you know, we we get a lot from ZBrush, but we really judge a lot from like what's actually printed in front of us. So mm -hmm. we, you know, we know what needs to be punched, what needs to be thicker, thickened, and bigger. You know, so we do a little bit of of hands-on treatment too. I I have one thing to add to that. Yes. In, we use KeyShot a lot. We use it for all of our marketing shots. Um, yeah, KeyShot is absolutely amazing. So thank you for the bridge. Thank you for KeyShot. Uh, yeah. So <laughs> we. Can we try that again? <laughs> Let's try this again. This <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they just. <laughs> uh, KeyShot. <laughs> Can we try it again? Maybe. Because the, the people. Are, the oh, people at home are like tapping on their keyboards. We, at home we did not have KeyShot for Infinity One, so we had to, uh, and that's when Matt came on. At the, at the, <laughs> poor, poor Matt. Poor at Matt. the end of Infinity One, we had to make uh, high resolution cinematic versions of our characters just so we could render them in Maya with the lighting setup and everything we need. And now, no more. We just push that baby right over to KeyShot, and we have a, a guy, uh, Nason Hardcastle, he's amazing at. He knows Keyshot inside and out now and makes our stuff look really good for marketing and all that stuff. He's got a pretty cool last yeah. name, Hardcastle. Hard One more Castle. question over here. Go ahead. Hey, guys. Daniel. Uh, quick oh, question boy. for Retopo. What do you guys like to use for your game res models? You jump into Maya? What do you do for Retopo? 3D Are we allowed code. To say? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, we use 3D code. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Yeah. We also use 3D code for uh, UVs. And we use uh, Topo Gun or X Normal to transfer maps. So. Hey, look at that walker. Cool. More questions. <laughs> Who's clapping back there? Just a minute. I saw a hand. Hey, there he is. I thought that was you. State your name. You didn't have a question before? Yes. What is it? <laughs> well, we're here now. <laughs> Hi. Uh, so, when you guys were talking about posing originally, and so you're still kind of in the concept phase or finishing the character. Uh, you said that you take it and rig it in Maya, mm -hmm. and then you transpose it in ZBrush. Mm -hmm. why, why is that? Is that just because of the, 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 the use of it with the game? Or I guess what I'm saying is why don't you just transpose so, it? So know, actually, we, what we do is we take a, an ugly decimated my, uh, model from ZBrush. Like we, we decimate the crap out of it, rig it a super, super primitive rig, um, and we send it over, and, and one of our concept artists actually just he roughs out a bunch of poses just so we can get a, a ton of ideas on the table. Um, and, and then once we kind of settle on an idea, we just use that as reference. We just take that OBJ and we just use it as reference and we riff off that and you know, we, don't, we don't follow it 100% and, and sometimes we divert from it, but mm -hmm. we just put it in the scene as reference and, and we can, you know, we kind of just, it's kind of like an image plane almost. We just, we use it where we need it, and then we just build off of it. Yeah. Just I, more for exploratory reasons yeah. than anything. And we can't take the high resolution version into Maya because it'll cry. So. And, and you're right. <laughs> and we just can't pose a million versions in ZBrush because it just takes too long. Yeah, it's impractical. <laughs> yeah. So. From yep. the tweet tweet feed, we have a question from Fernando de Ivone What's the shortest project deadline you've had to work on? <laughs> Say that. What's Fernando wants to know, Fernando, hey, what's the shortest deadline you've had to work on? Shortest deadline? Yeah. Oh, man. What about a day? <laughs> one day. Yeah, one day. Yikes. Randall, yeah. Better you than me. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, 
Yeah, that's hard to say. Okay, hang on. So we've got another <laughs> question. I, okay. From Zachary Williams. Uh, would like to know how the guys balance their time between watching tutorials and working on home projects and work. Watching uh, tutorials? We have. You, he would like to know how you guys balance your time between watching tutorials, working on home projects, and work. Are you doing some construction at your house that I'm not aware of? I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> home improvements. We, we make tutorials. Um, right, right. But to learn ZBrush back in the day, we had to watch quite a few. Um, but uh, there's seasons in, in game development that come and go. And right now, we're kind of in the, in the beginning season. And so we have, well, we should have some time to, to train and, and stuff like that. But now we're just into it. But then uh, towards the end of the development cycle, we basically live there. And, uh, but we're, we're kind of the front liners. We're, we're first to the battle. Mm -hmm. And so our season's early. And we have to have all the characters done and hand it off to rigging and modeling or uh, rigging and animation so they can get going and get testing all these moves that you're seeing in the game. So uh, we, we have we're we're first. We have to get all our stuff done first. Yeah. And I think so. it's uh, there's there's also like you know I, I still watch a bunch of tutorials and, and try yeah. to 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 learn a bunch because I mean. There, someone asked, asked me, like, so as an artist, like, what, what do you recommend? And, and to me, I, I think the biggest thing is, like, stay hungry. Mm -hmm. Stay hungry as an artist. Cause I, and I think it happens to everyone is, like, you get to a point of, like, dude, I feel, I feel good. Like, I'm great. <laughs> you know, and then you get punched in the stomach or, you know, you, you just... You, Something happens, you know. A new version of ZBrush. A new comes version out. of ZBrush comes out. <laughs> yeah, know? we call that the What's great equalizer. Sculpt, right? yeah. sculpt off happens, and like <laughs> Furio is just making. We'll talk you know, more about that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but it's you know you, you just you know it, you just have to stay hungry, and you, you you always have to like want to learn and keep keep going, and and there's always five minutes of a, in a day that you can sculpt or sketch or do something to progress as an artist and I think you know just having that drive to to allow yourself to to push I mean I think that's also that's I'd like to do. draw attention to the fact that you're both uh, very prolific in giving back to the community I was going to save this for later but maybe some people will tune out shame on you uh, during the interview but you have both a lot of learning resources on your websites so kudos yeah thanks yeah, so you thanks tune in thanks again yeah yeah Wow, unbelievable, and looky, looky, looky. Look what the wind blew in. Finally back to his rightful post, ladies and gentlemen, my friend and yours, Paul Gibri. Hey, thanks, Daniel. Thanks, Daniel. I don't know, where are we at? Were you guys done? I don't know. We could be. Well, we could be. <laughs> is, there more, is there more questions? Yeah, are there any more questions that you guys have here before we let them go to the back to the interview room? We and Furio is next as our next presenter, too. So uh, she's amazing. So if, 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 if you want to know a good workflow of sculpting hard surface in ZBrush, Furio is one of those guys that you definitely want to check out and watch because uh, yeah, his yeah, yeah. workflow is really powerful and how he does his hard surface and his design is just amazing. As what they keep bringing up here with his uh, sculpt off and in the green room too, and they keep bringing up Furio for the sculpt off. And they're watching us right now, so I'm just probably laughing right now. So, uh, so thanks guys. You guys are finito? Yeah. 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 Can we do Back a quick? Hey guys, Disney Interactive, Shane. <laughs> and Matt, the rope. 